hello everyone. So I'm going to be telling you about strange loops or capturing knots with powerful notations. First off, photos are okay because knots are hard to draw and that's one of the main points of my talk. So this is the hook. We have this quote from mathematician John Conway who says, Lido tells us that the numeration of the 54 knots of six took him six years. The notation we and you know us, we shall soon describe, made this just one afternoon's work. How did we, how did he do this? Well, here's how we're going to get there. We're going to start off with a crash course in knot theory. Then we'll talk about Alexander Briggs notation, which is sort of a simple, bad notation. Go into Docker notation, which augments it. Talk about enumeration briefly. And then finally answer the question by going through Conway notation. And then we'll talk about modern tabulations. The question you should have in mind here is which of these notations do modern knot theorists actually use? And then finally, lessons that may or may not be related to programming languages. So, what is a knot? First, I want to give some credit to this book, which I borrowed a lot of the intro material from. So our impression of a knot is, you know, sort of, you have a length of string, and then you, you know, tie it like a normal shoelace knot, like this, right? But mathematicians, do one thing, and that's they join the ends like this, or on the slide. So in math speak, they've embedded uh, a line into R3. And one thing that mathematicians can do that we can't do is have a stretchy knot. So you might start with uh, you might start with the thing over there, and you can sort of move it around and move the orange thing down and move the other leg over, and then you end up with this knot, which is exactly the same, well, exactly, for some definition called the trefoil. When we talk about knots, we usually talk about them in terms of crossing. So a crossing is just one strand over the other. The simplest knot is the unknot. It's just a circle. And a more complicated type of knot, which we don't consider a knot, is a link, which is multiple pieces. So this is like a Venn diagram. Those are the Olympic rings. So now that you've seen all these knots, how do we actually tell them apart? Well, we have this sort of basic definition of equivalence where we have three different moves we can do to a string and they're, they all preserve equivalence. So first one, straight string, twist it over or untwist it, convince yourself this is the same thing. Second one, you sort of take two strings and move one over the other, it doesn't change anything. Third one, you have a crossing and you move a string over or under it, doesn't change anything. So you might be wondering, well, these two knots that I've just seen, how do we know they're not actually the same knot? Maybe there's some way we can maneuver this thing in order to make it into a simple circle. And you have to take my word for the fact that the answer is no, but you know, you can look it up later. So let's talk about Alexander Briggs notation. First, knots are very complicated. The ones you've seen are pretty simple, and they're very visual. So their visuality gives rise to the following pretty hard problem. As Conway said, one thing I never figured out was, how do I tell a knot to a nerd over the phone? Keep in mind that the person you're talking to is just as much of a nerd as you are. You know, so the person sitting next to you at Strange Loop, how are you going to tell them that knot? So we're going to pick one particular example called the stevedore knot. Uh, it's one that sailors use to tie ropes to stop them from slipping. So those of you in the audience who are interested in nautical things might like this. Okay, it's a knot theory talk. There has to be a knot pun. <laughs> so here's our sort of mental model of the thing. That's the stevedore knot with the ends closed. And we want to transmit that over the phone to someone else who's going to try and draw or write down the exact same knot. <laughs> and you know, if you mess up, then they're going to be angry. So think about the person next to you. They're going to be angry if you mess this up. So the most trivial thing to do is, well, you know, we have this knot, and we think about knots in terms of crossings, so let's count the number of crossings that send that over the wire. You know, uh, one analogy might be taking an object and serializing it into text, and then the other person deserializes that knot, or that text into an object. But how effective is this notation? Well, I mean, you get a six. What do you do with that six? It could be either of these knots. Take my word for the fact that they are different and not the stevedore knot, which you can prove. So this notation has a really big problem, and that is 
it compresses the knot too much. It threw away too much information, and now we cannot reconstruct it. So let's try and augment that by talking about Docker notation. So starting with this knot again, how are we going to augment the number of crossings? Well, the most obvious thing to do is sort of talk about specific crossings and add directions on top of them. So, OK, let's arbitrarily pick this crossing and start going around this way. And now we're going to travel along the knot on that strand. So the first crossing is labeled 1. We go around. The next one is labeled 2. Go around 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, just traveling around. And we finish decorating the knot so by now it looks like a Christmas tree with a bunch of baubles, and we've got numbers on all the crossings. Let's write all the numbers down. So notice that there are six crossings, so there are 12 numbers, because every crossing gets passed through twice, because there's an overstrand and an understrand. In addition, every crossing gets an odd and an even number. You should convince yourself about this. It's an exercise for the reader. So, OK, the thing is we have a lot of redundant information here that we can throw away without any loss of fidelity. And that is the fact that every crossing gets passed through twice. So throw away half of them. Just keep the ones with odd numbers at the top and sort them. This is our new notation. Still, there is some redundant information. We can throw away the odd numbers at the top and have that as a protocol. We'll always have the first n odd numbers on the top where n is the number of crossings. So our final notation is our name for the knot in Docker notation, which is 8, 6, 10, 2, 12, 4, which is you know, not a very thrilling name, but that's the name. Notice one thing. This knot was an alternating knot, meaning that as you travel around it, you go over a strand and then under, over, and so on. So Docker notation can encode non-alternating knots. It's pretty simple. I just won't talk about it. OK, so we're going to send that over the wire. Here is our tin can phone, and we're thinking about the stevedore knot, and we're saying, the sequence of text and sending it to that person, and they're like, okay, so now what do I do? First, I want us to think about sort of correspondences between knots and notations. How many different notations could you have sent over? So when we started with this, we could have made many choices. We could have picked any of the crossings to start from. We could have picked the overstrand or the understrand to start from. We could have gone forward or backwards. So that gives you about four n different notations for the same knot. And that's one thing the person on the other end has to keep in mind. Here's a more general diagram. What we really want is this green one, a bijection, a one-to-one -one correspondence between object and notation. That's the goal. But unfortunately, it doesn't exist for knots unless you can invent one now, which would be pretty cool. So what we have here is you know, a slightly worse scenario, which is that one knot can correspond to multiple notations. We just saw this. We might have the case where one notation can correspond to multiple knots. We will see this. And we might have cases where a notation corresponds to nothing. We will see this too. We will see cases where a knot will not have any notation, which is also a problem. Is that why it's called a knot? Yes. <laughs> a knot or not a knot. So back to the person on the right. They got your transmission. What are they going to do with it? It's actually sort of a hard puzzle, because they have to reverse engineer the entire process you went through traveling around the strands. So let's start. Our knot named 8, 6, 10, 2, 12, 4. Forget you ever saw the original diagram. We first put the first n odd numbers back on top. OK, cool. Now we're going to sort of go backwards and start with, oh, the first crossing was 1 by definition, and the next crossing was 2, and that has a 7 attached to it, and the next crossing was 3, just because that's the order we traveled through it on. So we're going to do that. So the first crossing, 1, 8, 2, 7, and so on. And I drew it twice because there are going to be two possibilities later. So that's the first part. And eventually, you will hit a point where, after you've done the fifth crossing, what, the sixth crossing is a paired number that's already there. So now you're going to loop back onto this sort of bridge spine thing that you drew. But here, we could have gone around either way. So that's already a difference in diagrams. And just keeping on with the drawing, when you do the other crossings, there are also going to be more multiple ways. And this you know, is a problem with Docker notation in general. And those two are not drawable. So I'm not going to go into the details of why, but there are ways to sort of trap yourself inside a diagram. 
And sometimes you might need to add a new crossing that's not on the spline. So, okay, great, we finished drawing the two knots. But, you know, what does this get us? Are they even the same thing? We started with the same notation. Should they be the same knot? And are they even the stevedore knot that we wanted in the first place? So that's our problem. Does anyone see if they are the same knot? Yeah, so you can just sort of move the top loop over to the bottom and convince yourself they're the same thing. So we'll just talk about the red one. The most important question, so did we successfully transmit this thing? We're going to cheat a little and start with the decorated knot we had, but in general, we could just sort of write out all ways and test that. So we're going to correct a mistake I made in the drawing and then rotate the knot 180 degrees, which does not change the knot at all. So we're going to try and match up this 1-8 with that 1-8. So this traveling around the 1-8 is an overstrand. That's an overstrand. That's very promising. So let's try and correspond the two knots. With blue, OK, that's pretty good. You can sort of see the strange loop starting to form. Green one, OK, yeah, I'm, this looks pretty good, that next loop. And finally, OK, so I think they are the same knot. But this you know, was a visual proof and was not very rigorous. And in general, when you draw knots, they're going to end up in this weird form, and you know, you're going to have to do some work <laughs> to figure out if they're really the same knot. Poor thing. So this notation gave us something really important that we might not have realized in the first place. And that is, every single knot has a Docker notation. And what does that buy us? Well, if we write out every single Docker notation, then we will have enumerated every single knot inside that list. So all knots are a subset of all Docker notations, but there might be some junk that we have to throw out, and we'll see how that happens. So let's talk about how to actually enumerate knots with Dockers. Recall that our knot notation was just a bunch of even numbers in some permutation that were consecutive. So, because this is a programming conference, here is one slide of code where we enumerate Dockers, and you know, it's pretty algorithmic and easy. This is written in Haskell. So, Docker is one, meaning all of the knots with Docker notation with one crossing, it's one, two, and you know, there we get that knot, which is strange loop 2015, woo! Unfortunately, this is not actually a knot because you can untwist it into an unknot and it's not really what we're looking for. So that's our first hint that enumeration might be harder than we thought. Next, we have all Dockers with two crossings. And, you know, that's great, but each one of them can have their ends untwisted, and they both turn into unknots. So more trash that we have to throw out. And then all Dockers with three crossings. Well, how many knots do you think are actually inside that list? Yeah, so there's exactly one knot with three crossings, and it's mirror image, which we'll ignore. And that's the trefoil we just saw. That's the correct one. A couple of the notations correspond to the same trefoil, but you know, just starting at a different crossing. And some of them are just plain old unknots. So one thing we can do with Docker notation to check equivalence is we can find something of this form inside a knot and untwist it, because when you go through the strand, you're going to give it number n. And then when you go back, you're going to give it n plus 1. So if you see n and n plus 1 paired, you can always be like, oh, well, always untwist this. So let's just ignore it. That's one way to check equivalence. There are a lot of other heuristics. So now that we've gotten a short intro to enumeration with Dalker, let's talk about the history. Because we didn't invent this in isolation. There's a lot of very interesting prior work. In fact, the prior work goes back as far as 1870, where Lord Kelvin thought, well, I think atoms are vortices in the luminiferous ether. That's how they talked back then. So <laughs> if we write out all of these vortices, which are knots, then we will have a periodic table of all the elements. So Kelvin's like, well, Tate, Tate is a physicist of the time. Do you think that thing is possibly lead? And Tate is like, yeah, I'm right on this. I'm going to enumerate all the knots and find the periodic table and make myself famous. But you know, as we found out in 1900, Rutherford was like, I'm pretty sure atoms are not knots. They're like electrons and stuff. So fine. But knot theorists carried the torch forward. <laughs> so this is what a table actually looks like. This is from Wikipedia. Notice that our good friend, the Stevedore knot, is hanging out over here. 
And one thing that enumeration can do for us is make Alexander Briggs notation work, circled in green. Because once we have tables, we can just say, oh, hey, friend next to me, who I'm talking to over the phone for some reason, I want to tell you about the first knot with six crossings in my knot table. And because we have a table with some arbitrary order, we can just do this. So that's what one thing tables can do for us. Another great thing, according to a knot theorist, we hope that the census, which they did of knots, they call it a census, will serve as a rich source of examples and counterexamples, and as a general testing ground for our intuition. This is really useful, because sometimes you'll have theorems that seem true, and are true for the first 100,000 knots, and then on the thousandth knot with 15 crossings, your theorem will be wrong. And it's really great to have a table to just check that on. So our general strategy for enumeration is going to be the same as we did here. We're going to write out all the notations, enumerate that textually, and then group the knots that are actually equivalent, and then throw out some random trash that's stuck in there. There are a couple of schools of notation. Docker is just one of them. Alexander Briggs isn't even a school. That doesn't count. So we have one school that breaks down the knot, which we just talked about. It started with Gauss, yes, that Gauss, in 1800, who you know, ran around the knot in the same way Tate, the physicist we just talked about, and Docker himself. The next school builds up the knot. It is a totally different approach. It doesn't take a knot and give you the number. It sort of defines these irreducible primitives that combine in ways to form knots. And this school includes Kirkman from the 1880s, Conway himself, and Cadron, a contemporary. So let's go into Conway notation and try to find out the answer to this question. Why is his notation so much more efficient? We saw that Docker wasn't that efficient because checking equivalence is really hard and sort of arbitrary when we need heuristics. So here are the primitives we're going to talk about. We have twists, which you get by just uh, taking two strings and twisting them like this, fine. Then we have tangles, which combine twists and tangles in some way. And then we have knots, which do something to tangles to turn them into a loop and not just string them in a circle. Here is what some tangles in the wild look like. Again, I want to acknowledge the notebook for a very good intro material. So here is an abstract picture of a tangle. Now this stuff is going to be seem very sort of technical and arbitrary, but we'll see why they're defined in a few slides on. So a tangle is just a circle with two strings in it twisted in some way. There are four corners, the northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast corners. Here are two of the simplest tangles. Every tangle starts with these and gets built up. So we have the zero tangle, which is you know, two strings with the endpoints at the corners, or the infinity tangle, which is the other way. So the zero tangle, we can make the one tangle just by twisting it upward once, so the bottom strand comes to, to the top and is over the other strand. And the three tangle, you just twist it three times. And it's also the same as one plus one plus one. What is one plus one? The way we define tangle addition is very pretty, very simple. So we have these two tangles and we just connect their northeast endpoints and the northwest ones, same for the southern ones. So that's T1 plus T2. Here is a slightly more complicated operation. We have two tangles, T1 and T2, and we want to multiply them. First, we're going to flip the first tangle over the northwest through southeast diagonal. So just like this. And then after they're flipped, we just add them. We've talked about addition already. So when you see T1 times T2, or we might get rid of the multiplication symbol, you should think flip, then add. That's all that is. How do we make these tangles into knots? What we do is we have this thing called the one star polyhedron, which is basically just saying, OK, you have a tangle. Now just plug it in here and connect the endpoints. For example, we have the two one tangle. To turn that into a knot, which uh, the tangle is the thing in the circle, the knot is the entire thing. We just plug it in, and that's the final result. So yes, sort of technical, weird, and arbitrary. Yes and no. There is sort of a deep reason why we define these in this way. So let's go through an example. 
let's try to construct the tangle called 3 to negative 4. So, as we said, just start with 3 by twisting it 3 times. Now we're going to try and make 3 times 2 because this notation is left associative. Okay, so we're going to do 3 times 2. When you see multiplication, think flip, then add. So flip, then add. Okay, great. That's the 3 times 2 one. Now that one's done. It's left associative. Let's do the 3 times 2 times negative 4 tangle. Think flip, then add. So flip, add. So that's the entire thing. Pronounce 3 to negative 4 or 3 times 2 times negative 4. And we make it into a knot by simply putting it into the polyhedron. So when we draw it a little better, we end up with this beautiful knot, 3, 2, negative 4. It's very happy to be here and see you all. So if we get rid of the multiplication operation and just think about what we're doing abstractly, what we're doing is making a knot by starting with these two strings and then twisting any two adjacent endpoints, like say twist the bottom and then twist these two and then twist the top and so on. So you can swap the top ones, right ones, bottom ones, or left ones. That's multiplication, that's what it's doing. So you can reverse it, so any tangle constructed in this way can be untangled by just swapping adjacent endpoints. Okay, still so seems a little bit weird and arbitrary. Why do we care about this? Well, this is a picture of DNA, and it's tangled in a very tangly sort of way. So these tangles actually describe the topology of DNA in the wild very well, because as it turns out, the only way that nature can really tangle things is by swapping adjacent endpoints, and it ends up like this. Well, you might be thinking, well, but maybe every tangle can be untangled and tangled by just swapping adjacent endpoints. Like, is there anything more complicated? And actually, there's a simple counterexample to that. So the ones we talked about are rational tangles. They're the easy ones. The harder ones are these things called algebraic tangles. It, this is just the 3 plus 3 tangle. And convince yourself that this can't be untangled just by swapping adjacent endpoints. OK, so let's move into the same thing we've been trying to do all along, which is how are we going to transmit this knot over the phone? Pretend that Conway is trying to send this to you, and you're receiving it from him. So he's thinking, he's thinking about the Steven or not. And you know, how would you do this? Try and identify the tangles in this and how you would build up the knot. So OK, Conway's got an idea. He, he's going to rotate the knot. Good job, Conway. <laughs> and he thinks, oh, look at these two circles. They look like circles with uh, strings in the corners. And those look a lot like tangles made by twisting. In fact, that looks just like the 4-2 knot. So Conway is very happy, and he is going to send this over to you now you are going to receive it and be very happy because there's a very well-defined algorithm to draw these knots, which we just talked about. But in general, it's easy for you on your end to receive the knot. It was hard for, it will be hard for Conway in general because we have you know, these more complicated knots that are not so easy to decompose into tangles. They require a non-trivial amount of manipulation and swapping. And there actually exist knots which don't have a Conway notation. So you might be thinking, well, but then we can't use it for enumeration at all. Why are we even talking about this? We should throw it out. That's true. Not that we should throw it out, but we should really seriously doubt whether we should use this. It turns out that because his notation encodes these sort of deep intuitions about knots, most of the small knots are rational, so we can still do this. So let's talk about how to enumerate knots with Conway. So say we want to enumerate all knots of three crossings. How are we going to write all, all the tangly things that will enumerate these knots? Well, so consider the one tangle. You twisted it once, so you added one crossing. Say the number of crossings in a tangle is absolute value of t. Then every operation adds the number of crossings 
So for example, when you multiply T1 and T2, the number of crossings in them is the sum of the number of crossings in each individual one. So we want to sort of work backwards from this adding and decompose a number into multiple numbers. There's a mathematical word for this. You are partitioning the number. So here's how you partition three, for example, the number three. It could be separated into three groups of one, or two groups of one thing and then two things, or two groups of two things and then one things. In general, they're not the same, so we're going to have both of them, or just one group of three things. What have we just done? This is absolutely isomorphic to knots of three crossings, because now we have four tangles with three crossings. One, 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 two, two, one, three, and you all remember how to multiply tangles and knots in order to get these, right? So now that we have these notations and we have a very nicely algorithmic way to draw the diagrams, we can do something pretty incredible. We can just draw them all on a computer. So uh, I wrote some code in Haskell to decompose or partition numbers and then just draw them. It uses the diagrams library, which is fabulous. So these are all the raw knots and links up to seven crossings. And you can see their notations next to them. OK, but you want to know the answer to the question, how is Conway's notation more efficient than other people's notation? We talked about how equivalence is an, not equivalence is an open problem, which people haven't solved yet. So we're going to see how Conway solved this problem via basically magic. I mean, math and magic are the same thing, right? So let's consider these two tangles. So why do we care about tangle equivalence? Well, if a tangle, or if a knot is composed of tangles, then if all the knots in a tangle are exactly the same or equivalent by moving stuff around, then the knots are equivalent. So tangle equivalence implies knot equivalence. So these two tangles have different notations, but they're the same because what we can do is take that loop over there rotate it out of the plane of the page and end up with that one. So that was negative two, two, twisted it two times and then added it to another two twist. This is two, one, twisted it two times, added it to something with one twist. So they're equivalent. And we're going to do something that seems weird and arbitrary again. We're going to take these notations and put them inside a continued fraction backwards. So two, one becomes the continued fraction one plus one over, and then the next number, which is two, which yields three halves. Negative two, two is going to become two backwards plus one over the first number, negative two, three halves. It's the same. Wow, what an amazing, weird, arbitrary coincidence. Has mathematics gone too far? <laughs> What's going on here? What is this one weird trick to check not equivalence? Conway, how did you do this? So in summary, we're putting the tingles notation, just the numbers and text, backwards into a continued fraction. This will yield a rational number because all of the numbers are integers. And we have the theorem that rational tangles are equivalent if and only if they're represented by the same rational number. Why? Why? Well, unfortunately, I can't give you the intuition for the proof now because it's pretty long and involved, but you should look at the footnotes. The one problem with this is that, well, you know, if Conway had solved this for every single kind of tangle and most knots were tangles, and he's, you know, just solved knot equivalence, the big open problem, right? So he should have a Fields medal. Unfortunately, this only works for rational tangles, the easier ones that are, you know, made in nature just by swapping adjacent endpoints. Unfortunately, the algebraic ones, which we saw earlier, which can't be decomposed by swapping adjacent ones, well, we're going to need some tricks and weird stuff to get those to work. So these algebraic knots, we already talked about the one-star polyhedron on the top left. We've been using that all along. But more complicated knots are going to need these other polyhedra that you're plugging tangles into in order to solve the problem of, well, some knots don't have a Conway notation. So that's a little problematic. But it turns out, again, that small knots, meaning knots of seven crossings or under, are all rational knots. So we can do this. So, the answer to our question, 
How did Conway enumerate his knots so much faster than Whittle did them? He proved very powerful theorems about special cases. So I'm willing to bet that what he did was him, a human, he took a pencil and enumerated all of these knots and then calculated each of their continued fractions and threw out the ones that he didn't want. And he was able to do this algorithmically without any diagram chasing or whatever. So he did this in one afternoon. But Little, who used DAC notation, didn't have these powerful affordances for small knots. So he spent you know, six years pushing these strings around on paper and trying to figure out which ones were equivalent in basically Docker notation. So now all of you have all the information needed to decide whether modern knot theorists use Conway or Docker notation. So who here thinks that modern knot theorists use Docker notation? Raise your hand. Okay, so a little less than half, a lot less than half, actually. And who here thinks that they use Conway? Okay, so about three-fourths. So we're going to talk about this absolutely marvelously titled paper called the first 1,701,936 knots. If you ever needed a party fact, you have one. All the knots of uh, 16 crossings or less, there are 1,701,936 of them. So again, what notation did they use? Well, the answer is going to be on the next slide, so think hard about what you answered. Maybe you want to switch it. So I was also curious about this, and I emailed you know, an actual knot theorist about this. And here is what he responded via email. I find it intriguing that the most successful modern tabulations don't use all the cleverness that Conway found, and instead use Dagger notation, which is a much more naive notation. This is Dylan Thurston, who is a professor of topology. So the two or three of you who chose Dagger, congratulations, you're right. Why? Why did they do this? Why did they do this one, as Dylan said, Conway found all of this cleverness? So in this marvelously titled paper, they compare and contrast the two notations. Docker is very compact. It doesn't have Conway's complicated series of protocols. But again, it's hard to manipulate. But Conway's is worse for very big knots. Why? Well, as Host says, Host is the author of this paper, Conway's scheme draws on a large set of symbols, which you saw, arranged according to a rather large set of rules, which seem arbitrary at times both of which grow with crossing number, which is bad because when we enumerate knots, we want to increase the crossing number more and more up to 16 or 20. And for this reason, it does not lend itself well to computer programming. This is a pretty significant problem. The thing is, well, you might be thinking, well, why even talk about Conway? He invented this thing, but nobody's using it. So what? It's just a detour in the history of knot theory. It turns out that the insights encoded in his notation actually helped him discover a new algebraic invariant, which I'm not going to talk about. But this basically opened up a new field of sub, a subfield of knot theory because algebraic invariants are sort of hard to come by, and he invented a new one. So, what are some takeaways we can get from, you know, a tale of two notations? We have several axes against which to contrast and compare any notation you want to talk about. First, do they break down objects or build them up? So, you know, think about your favorite serialization protocol or something. How easy is it for humans to read and write? How easy is it for machines to read and write? Is it minimal? Are there a lot of rules? Do they grow the crossing number? And finally, how do notations correspond to objects? this diagram, again, where knots can be replaced with objects. Do we have, you know, the mother load, a bijection between notation and object, which would mean we have somehow perfectly captured the essence of the object in text? Or do we have some problems? Does one object correspond to multiple notations? Does one notation correspond to multiple objects? Are there invalid notations or objects? Some more significant axes. How easy is it to read important insights off of this notation? How legible is it? What kinds of insights does it encode? Did you prove some powerful theorems that helped you? How easy is it just to do common operations on this notation for your object? Maybe uncommon operations can be harder. 
And most importantly, what new manipulations and ways of thinking does your notation encourage? So now for some programming language lessons. So say we can think about this correspondence. So programs are sort of like a blob in your head that's you know, vaguely like a knot. So this person is thinking about maybe the identity function as a blob in their head, some sort of essence, and that corresponds to the knot. We can say that a programming language corresponds to a notation for that knot. So an object in that language, a program, corresponds to a notation for that particular knot. There's also an interesting correspondence between program equivalence and knot equivalence. Both are hard problems. Program equivalence has been proven undecidable. Knot equivalence, again, is an open problem, so it hasn't been proven hard, but it seems pretty hard. And in both cases, we want to just look at the syntax or the notation of the object and figure out, are their essences the same? Are they the same? In summary, don't get too attached to one notation or representation. There can be something really useful, unexpected, or interdisciplinary just waiting for you to discover or invent it. Actually, that's not the real takeaway. The real takeaway is this movie poster for Conway's notation. <laughs> so Link Not, a book written by not theorists, reviews it as powerful. Host reviews it, actually, as deep structure properties of knots, four stars. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff I elided in this talk. You should consult these sources. In particular, I read at least four undergraduate honors theses to get a lot of the material because knot theory is accessible to people with not a lot of prior background. So I read like four theses from seniors in college. They were very good. And I really want to thank the people who helped me with this talk. Uh, David Branner, who helped me an unbelievable amount. I can't even thank him enough. Rose Ames, who was in the audience and listened to a practice talk at 6 a.m. today. Thank you so much. Dylan Thurston, a bona fide knot theorist who humored this programming language researcher who got interested in knots. Um, William Skeeth, who gave great feedback via email. Leonard Berenger, one of my advisors who listened to a practice talk on a whiteboard. And finally, the Recurse Center for having awesome people who encouraged me to submit this talk and gave feedback on it. So if you want the code for the knot drawing or whatever other code I had, you should look at this repo. Right now, it's not for public consumption, but it will be in a few days. And you can ask me questions on Twitter. Thanks.